Good morning, church. This morning, Pastor Lauren and I are in Nairobi, Kenya, and we'll be speaking at a church there. And then also we'll be training leaders for these next two weeks. And so we're excited to be there, but we wanted to greet you here in Dubuque and in Platteville because we love you and just want to say good morning to you. Good morning, everybody. Yes, you are in for a special blessing this morning. Pastor Michael Vincent Lopez, our campus pastor from the Platteville campus and our youth pastors bringing the word of the Lord this morning. And I know it's gonna be really, really good. So get ready, get ready to receive, be blessed. God to do a wonderful work in your life. Here we go. 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 Father, we just say, have your way today. Lord, we enter in this morning. We're hungry to receive what you got for us. Lord, as a congregation, as a body, but Lord, what you've got for us individually. Lord, what you have for us as a families that are in here today. And so, Lord, we truly just say, uh, search us. Point things out in us that need to change. Lord, we're good ground to receive we're good hearts to receive what you have for us. And so, Lord, truly we say, have your way in each one of us right here, right now, today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Like Pastor Lauren said, uh, I am Pastor Michael Vincent Lopez. I love it when he does that, never know. Um, my wife, Pastor Amanda, is on the front row. We have been, uh, hey, just settle down here, up here. <laughs> Uh, we've been the youth pastors here for, I think, six years, been the assistant pastor for a few years, and then last season, last fall, uh, we accepted uh, campus pastors, so we're over in Platteville, Wisconsin, as the campus pastors over there. It's a privilege and an honor over there. It's an awesome body uh, of believers over there, a church, healthy, growing, and strong, so it's, it's been a fun, uh, fun run. Um, we've been on a series titled Victory, His Battle, Our Benefit. Has everybody been here? Y'all going to be quiet. All right. Well, we're going to spin that around in just a second. Pastor's been on a series, Victory, His Battle, Our Benefit, Glory to God. And today we're stepping into, um, I think it's part four, Freedom from Fear. And so if you've missed any of the previous weeks, make sure you catch up because they all build upon the next. And so we're going to dive into the fourth week. But if you missed, man, go back, catch up, and, and get right back up where everybody's at. Freedom from Fear. Look over to Psalms 34, 1 to 4, as we get started this morning. No longer a slave to fear because a child of God. Saved, changed families. Fear is not in your DNA. It's not a part of your life. And it can't be if we don't let it. Psalms 34, 1 to 4 says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Anything else? Nope. Nothing else. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. That's good news. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. He freed me from all of my fears. He freed you from all of your fears. He freed you from all of your fears. I said, he, the Bible says he freed you from all your fears. Moms, he freed you from all your fears. Dads, he freed you from all your fears. Business owners, you've been freed from all your fears. Students, team leaders, individuals in here, believers, that's the, the whole body here. Man, you've been freed from all of your fears. So I tell you what, as we jump in this morning, let's just turn up a little bit of the excitement. Man, the joy comes, man, because we're free. I'm turning up the expectancy on myself, man, I, I, getting ready to receive some truth here. Because the truth sets us free, doesn't it? So I tell you what, get ready. Might as well pull your connection cards out. They're on the seat back in front of you. Get ready to write down a testimony of what he did for you. When you go to work tomorrow, get ready to testify on what God has released and freed you from because you're free from all fears. You don't have to live in fear. And today we're going to learn how to get and stay free from fear. Your life, it will never be the same after today. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? All right. Wrong thinking defeats people. 
It's the best place to start. We're going to hit this and we're going to move on. Wrong thinking defeats people. If we're thinking on the wrong things, if we're thinking about the wrong things, if we're worrying about the wrong things, right here, it sounds like a battlefield in the mind. If we begin to think on and worry on and feed on and, and just ponder on the wrong things, what did we say? Wrong thinking defeats people. What it's going to do, it's going to walk down the staircase into our hearts. And there it's going to take root in our life. It's going to be what we begin to believe for our life. If we're thinking on, feeding on, a worry comes knocking at the door of our, our minds and our imaginations. If we allow it to and we play with it enough, it's going to walk down the staircase into our heart and it's going to take root down there. And it's going to become our believing, which in return is going to become our actions. It's going to become our speech. It's going to become our, our belief. It's going it's gonna, it's gonna to steer our life, so to say, which means then it will defeat you. If it's wrong, but we can think on the right stuff. We can feed on the right stuff, can't we? That's over in Philippians 4, 6 to 9, if you want to do it more, but uh, read about it more. It tells, tells us what to think on over there. But fear is deadly. The large factor on success and failure in our lives is how we handle fear. A large, a large factor on success or failure is how we handle fear. And the world is full of fear, isn't it? Man, it's, uh, it, you get in the car, there's, there, there's things to, we could be afraid of. We go to work, we, there's things we could be afraid of. If we turn on the TV, oh my, we don't have to say anymore. It's on the commercials, it's on the TV shows, it's on the news, it's all out there. Politics, economic collapse, diets, health, ingredients of foods, what's in my coffee, you know, pollution, terrorism, global warming, snakes, heights, dentists, clowns. I'm not afraid of clowns. I thought they were supposed to be funny and friendly, you know, blow up balloons and like, Give you whatever. Public speaking. Boy, I, I'm not going to allow that to jump on me this morning. Man, it's used to sell products, steer trends, and it's the devil's favorite weapon. 1 Peter 5.8 says, stay alert. Watch out for the, your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion. What's he doing? Seeking. He's looking for someone to devour. If he is given the chance, he's walking around looking for someone to devour. If he's given the chance to do it, if the door's left open for him to do it, if he sends a thought or an idea or a belief or something, come knocking at our minds, our imaginations. If, he's, if we play with it, he's looking for the chance to devour that person. And the devil, he don't care about age. He's a punk like that. He don't care if you're in middle school or grade school or whatever. He don't care if you're 95 years old. He's going to try to instill fear into that person's life whenever, however, uh, whoever he possibly can. Fear is widespread and it's deadly. It's faith in negative circumstances rather than faith in God's word. Faith in the devil's power to harm rather than faith in God's power to protect. Whether it's panic or worry or anxiety or stress or will I make it? Could I make it? Things will never improve for me. I'll always be alone. I always get the pig flu and the mouse flu. Marriage is too far gone. Finances are too messed up. Whatever the case might be, fear can freeze people from moving forward. Man, whether it's a person that is, that, that's, that's addicted in smoking and they want to be free from that addiction, but yet they're afraid that if they stop smoking, they'll, they'll become overweight, and if they become overweight, then their spouse is going to leave them. That's a predicament. Or maybe it's a person that they're, they're dissatisfied, they're unchallenged, they're unfulfilled, they're, they're, they're struggling, struggling financially, and they're praying for a new job. Lord, I hate this job. It's not, my, it's not, it's not me, man, and it's, it's not fulfilling, and it's just not where I believe you've got for me, and, and it's not even meeting the bills, yet they're, when, when the new job comes, they're afraid to step into it because they're like, man, if I leave my job that I'm unsatisfied with and I'm not making it any way financially, if I step over here into the new job, well, what if I don't make it? What if I fail? What if I get fired? What if, I, what if I'm not good enough? Fear keeps you from advancing. It keeps you from stepping into God's best. <sighs> Faith moves the hand of God, but fear moves the hand of the devil. The environment the enemy thrives in 
is fear. The environment that, listen, the environment the enemy thrives in is fear. Has the enemy been thriving in any area of our, our lives, of our family's lives? Have we allowed him in? Because the enemy thrives in the environment of fear. Christians can't afford to be complacent about fear. We can't. We got to be aggressive we can't be complacent when it comes to fear. We can't sit back. We can't allow it to take control of our life because if we allow it, if we give it any room, all it does is take more ground. All it does is take more ground. It's, it's just there to steal, to kill, and destroy any area it's allowed to. If we, too, too many times we allow fear into one spot in our life, but it's never satisfied there. If, it, if it, it'll steal more ground and more ground, it never stops. It's, it's just like a fungus. It, it's, like a, it's like a hostess plant. I don't know. You can't kill them. It's like they just keep growing. And if you plant one in your yard, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what fear likes to do. It just likes to, well, I'm going to steal this. And I'm going to kill a little bit of this. And I'm going to destroy a little bit more of this. If we, if we just sit back and we allow it to, it'll take control of our life. And it'll, t- it'll take more ground in our life. And it'll just kill, steal, and destroy more areas in our life. We've got to really come to the point where we're able to identify and we're able to conquer it. Otherwise, it's going to destroy and it's going to rule our lives. It's just a fact. And so a great example that we can learn from is David over in 1 Samuel 17, if you want to turn over that way. Otherwise, I think they put it on the screen. But I tell you, where he, we're going to learn how to identify and how he identified fear and how he conquered fear. 1 Samuel 17, and what we've got going on here is we've got the Philistine army over on one hill. I, I like pictures. Let's call them the bad guys. Then we've got the Israelites over on this hill. And what we've got is we've got the Philistines on one side facing off against the Israelites, and for 40 days, that's a lot of days, to stare at each other. <laughs> For 40 days, this dude named Goliath, who was a giant of a man, would come out every single morning and every single night, and he would step forward from the Philistine army, and he would look at the Israelite army, and he would trash talk the Israelites. He would mouth talk them. Bring it on. Send send your best man to come fight me, and it will determine the war. You win, so be it. If I win, so be it. We win. Bring out one man to, to challenge me. Forty days, morning and night, he trash-talked the Israelite army. Over in 1 Samuel 17, 23, it says, Suddenly the champion named Goliath the Philistine from Gath came forward from the Philistines and shouted his usual words, which David also heard. When all the men of Israel saw Goliath, they fled from him in great fear. You could almost say they fled from him as in terror. Here we've got David, and he came to visit. He's not, he's not, he's not one of the warriors. He's just bringing some food. I'm sure he's just coming to see how his brothers are doing. He probably brought a thermos of coffee with him. I mean, if, if my brother came to see me, he better bring coffee. Otherwise, you know... Go home, man. No, I don't know. And here he's just coming to visit. How many years has a fear frozen you? How many, fear, how many years has a fear frozen one of us? How, how many missed opportunities have we missed because of fear? Or God's telling us to possess something, yet fear has caused us to be so afraid that we haven't stepped over and into the best of what God has for our lives. Fear freezes our future. That's what it does. And here we've got two things in here in in verse 23. First of all, Goliath shouts his usual words. The devil's got no new tricks. That's why we get in the word of God. That's why we get in the Bible, because we find out that the devil is just using the same stupid stuff generation after generation after generation, so we shouldn't be surprised. God doesn't sit up there and 
devil does something and he bumps Michael the archangel. He's like, whoa, did you, I did not see that coming. That was new. No, God doesn't do that. He doesn't do that at all. First, Goliath was shouting the same usual words. That's the same thing the devil likes to do. Secondly, David heard, which means now David has a decision. David could sit back and say, I'm not, even, I'm not even one of the warriors. I'm just here. I'm just Jimmy John's being super, super fast, bringing some sandwiches. You know, I'm going to go home. Man, y'all got a big problem on your hands. He's really big. Good luck. No, David heard. So now he has a decision to sit back or to fear like the rest of the army of the Israelites, or he could do something about it and conquer it and remove it. Over in verse 26, it says, David asked the men who were standing with him, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine? And listen, removes this disgrace. Man, underline those words right there. Removes this disgrace from Israel. Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Man, if that doesn't rise something up on a believer to remove this disgrace from my life. How dare you come knocking at my door and try to take parts of my life, fear? Remove this fear from our lives. Here, here's the problem. Sadly, people learn the good blame game. We all know the blame game. I've played it a little bit too. Not today. The good blame game, and that's the thing. It ain't a game at all. It's a life or death decision is what's going on. My life is a mess. It's not my fault. It's their fault. It's everybody else's fault but my fault. It ain't my fault. My marriage is a mess, but it ain't. <laughs> you know I'm perfect. Come on. It's his or her fault. Man, I did everything right. I'm perfect. I don't know what their problem is. It's his or her fault. Bad diagnosis. It's because of this, this, or this. Maybe it's Alzheimer's symptoms. You know, it, it's, it's, it, just, it just runs in the family. Maybe we're starting to feel some symptoms of it. Maybe we're not feeling any symptoms. Here, catch this. Maybe relatives have had it, and they got it at this age. And so we begin to fear that thing, whether it's high blood pressure, whether it's Alzheimer's, whether it's whatever you want to put in the dots. And we're 20 years from when they got it. But that devil don't care how young, how old, or who you are. He'll come knocking at the door day after day if possible. And he'll try to instill something. He'll try to instill that fear into your head. Now you're, at a, you're in the battlefield now. Because he knows if he can make you become afraid of it. He's got all the time. He's, he just wants it to start coming down the stairs. It might not happen tomorrow. But I tell you what, all of a sudden, we begin to fear it. We get, begin to play with it. We begin to dink around with it. So it becomes to come down our stairs into our believing. And we begin to worry about it. And it begins to grow on the inside of us and starts to take a deeper root. I don't care what the fear is. I don't care what the lie is. And it starts to get a root in our life that all of a sudden it might not have been the next day. But all of a sudden you've got 10 years or 20 years worth of roots that have built up on the inside of you. That now all of a sudden when the symptom pops its head up. Now we do have a fight because we've allowed it to fester and to grow and to just produce in our life that this actually is something. That I am afraid of it when I hear that word. It does seem too big for God to take care of. And now we've got a whole nother battle. That's called a renewing of the mind. That's getting in the word of God and saying, oh Lord, I allowed this thing in my life for 10, 15, 20 years. My bad. But that doesn't change the word of God. We just got some renewing of the my, my mind to do. Amen. Cleaning some house out. God's looking for a people that know the authority they have through Jesus. He's looking for a people that will stand up. A people that will resist. And a people that will remove fear and things like this from their life and from their thinking. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself 
against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, man, we resist. It is our job to resist things. It is our job to cast down things. It is our jobs, if I, if I could say it this way, to grab things by the neck, so to say, and, and compare them to the word of God. When they come knocking at the door, we're able, to, we're able to resist. We're able to grab it by the throat. And I got a Bible verse in a second that shows the same thing. Hang on. Grab it by the throat and, and put it up to the word of God and say, where do you compare? And if it falls short, then you remove it and tell it to get. Verse 34. Now we start to see David remembering past victories. Now we begin to see David uh, remembering God's faithfulness in his life. David replied, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. And whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off the lamb from the flock, listen, verse 35, I went after it, struck it down. And delivered the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would, gra- I like that, I would grab it by its fur and strike it down and kill it. I told you I had a verse. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Man, don't let the devil. Defy you, son or daughter of the living God. How dare he come against you? The first thing is our job is to cast down. We decide what to allow and what to deny. That when when it comes knocking at the door, if I can say it this way, y'all know what a bouncer at the door is. You know what I'm talking about. Come on. Something comes knocking at the door and he opens that peaky hole up and he says, you life or death, good or bad. And we choose what to allow or deny into our life. If it says, well, I'm here to destroy, it would be stupid to let it in. It would be stupid to play with it. It'd be stupid to open the door and and fiddle with it and go, oh, oh, are you? You're going to destroy? No, that would be stupid. No, we deny it. We kick it out. Secondly, David remembers God's faithfulness. David's remembering the wins. Man, we need to remember personal testimonies. We need to look back at the win after win after win after win that God has done in our lives personally. And remember that if he did it then, he'll do it again. And if he did it for David, he'll do it for you because he's not a respect of persons. And if you're thinking, I'm not sure if I can remember any victories. Fine, are you saved? If not, at the end of service, you'll have the chance. That's a pretty big win. He's remembering. He's standing on God's word. He's standing on his promises. Verse 37, David added, The Lord who delivered me from the claws of the lion and the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. God doesn't change. Next, David talks to his fear. The fear shouting at him, isn't it? Come on, we've had fears before that are screaming at us. Screaming at us. David spoke to the fear. Reminds me of a story with Smith Wigglesworth, and he was, he was going to get on a bus. And there was this lady that was getting on the same bus as him, and she had this little puppy dog. I don't know, little puppy dog. Every dog should be 60, 70 plus pounds, but she had like a rat. And, and it was like, Row, 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 row. You know what they are, a little, little tail waggling, tongue out, and everything like that. And, and she's got to go to the grocery store. And so Smith is getting on the bus, and, and she's trying to get on the bus. But this dog, he can't get on the bus. No dogs on the bus. He's got to go home. And she'd turn around, and I don't know, she named the dog Fido. And she's like, Fido, go home. And she goes to get on the bus, and Fido, row, 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 row. She turns around and goes, Fido, go home. And Fido's not going home wagging his tail and tongue out. She spun around the third time. Get! That was for everybody who's sleeping. It's not about the volume, but it is all about knowing the authority that's backing you up. The name of Jesus. We don't play with fear. We don't play with junk from the enemy. We don't play with this garbage. There's got to be a fight that rises up on the inside that's greater than what's coming against on the outside. 
David identified it, and now he's going to conquer it. Verse 41 says, Now the Philistine came closer and closer to David. Isn't that how fears do? They just like to get in your face. I hate things in my face. I think I should have been from Texas. I like more room, man. If you're talking to me, keep an arm. No, I'm just fine. I like space, man. The Philistine came closer and closer to David with his shield bearer before him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he despised him because he was just a boy, ruddy and handsome like Mike Lopez. And am I a dog, he said to David, that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he called to David, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Man, fear is screaming at him, isn't it? The enemy's screaming at him. But David said to the Philistine, man, you come against me with a dagger and a spear and a sword, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. This day, I will strike you down. I will cut your head off, and I will give your carcass to the Philistines, to the birds of the air and the creatures of the earth. Then the whole world will know. I tell you, you what when we got a bunch of believers standing up the body of Christ that know and identify this kind of junk and will have the courage and the strength and the boldness to stand up and say no you don't I tell you what the world will take notice your workplace will take notice your family members will take notice then the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel and all those who assembled here will know that it is not by sword, it's not by spear, that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. Man, when fear talks, you talk back to it. David did. Words of faith. Unpaid bills, how dare you defy God's promise of provision on my life? Bad report from the doctor? Who do you think you are to defy God's promise of health upon my life? David's final step in conquering fear was to run. And not away. He ran towards. As the Philistine started toward forward to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. He didn't sit back in fear. He wasn't complacent. He advanced forward. Fear is defensive, but faith is offensive. It's just like somebody jumping around a corner. What happens? Boom! Woohoo! I don't know karate, but I know crazy. <laughs> fear is defensive, faith is offensive. Man, fear stopped an army, stopped thousands of warriors that day from advancing like they should have, like they could have, like that God wanted them to. Yet it took one person in faith, one person, person in complete trust, one person in re complete reliance in God to advance forward that sparked the rest of them to charge forward out of fear and to follow after into victory. Man, family could be ruled by fear and God is just looking for one family member to stand up and to stand out in faith and draw a line and say enough is enough and where the whole family family would then follow charge and advance forward into freedom and victory and in the things God has for them. The environment the enemy thrives in, though, is fear. He loves it. He thrives in it. He grows in it. Man, we are to have no fear. That counterdict, that, that counterdicted what we'll hear in the world. You're to have no fear. None. 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 No fear. I tell you what, there's decision, hard decisions being made right now. None. No fear in people's lives right now. Something, God's speaking and he's showing and he's pointing things out. Decisions, eternal decisions are being made right now. Things are being loosed off of your life right now. You're catching it. You're grabbing it. 
No fear. You're to have no fear. None whatsoever. What about a little bit? No fear. Hello, Lord, we're listening. No fear. Listen to this. You guys know this, uh, this story, man. This is such a great... Oh, uh, Matthew 8. I'm not going to read it uh, fully, but it records a time when Jesus and his disciples were in a ship and a violent storm came up. You guys remember this story now? Oh, my goodness. And although the disciples had already seen Jesus raise people from the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, they became fearful. They thought they were going to die. They thought they were going to drown. And here's Jesus on the back of the ship sleeping. And when Jesus awoke, listen to this, the disciples' alarming words didn't frighten him. Instead, he rebuked his disciples for being afraid. He rebuked the storm for making him have to wake up. He said, peace be calm, and it was. The disciples' alarming words didn't frighten him. What alarming words are coming your way? What things is the enemy trying to bring your way? What are you hearing from work? What are you hearing? Not going to make it. Not going to make it. Should be scared. Man, things have been tight. Sales have been down. The disciples' alarming words didn't frighten Jesus. Instead, he did something. He rebuked the storm. It's got nothing to do with our strength, but everything to do with the power of the Holy Spirit that's living on the inside of us. Man, the Holy Spirit doesn't wrestle with. He doesn't go nine rounds with. There's no competition. Every cartoon, the devil himself would like the, the, the child of God, Christian, believer, uh, to, to think that it's this big struggle. No, the Holy Spirit doesn't go nine rounds with him. He doesn't do this big wrestling match. There's no competition. The Bible says resist the devil and he flees from you, which means run from as in terror. Not he might go, not he should go. We're hoping he goes. Maybe after 20 rounds he might go. No, he said resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Here's the thing is we're living too much in the natural where we talk too much about the reports. We, we, we talk too much about how we, how we feel or what's happened or other people's experiences and things or, the phys, or we go by our physical senses not realizing there's a spirit world. We're not waiting on God. He has given us authority and we're, we're to stand and resist anything that kills, anything that steals, and anything that destroys. We're to identify and we're to conquer it. Period. So there's three things that I want to help. I want to, I want to leave you with. Three things that will help you rise above fear. You ready? All right. Three things that will help us rise above fear. Number one, know the truth of God's word. Knowing the truth of God's word. John 8, 32 says, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Got to get it in you. There's a, man, that's the thing about God. It's, it, we're to resist the devil and he'll flee. We're to do it. We're to take those imaginations and grab hold of what comes knocking at the door. We're to do something about it and cast things down that don't line up with the word of God. And here it is again. And you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free, which means you, you got to dig into the word. You got to find out what his promises are. You got to find out what he declares over your life. Things that you should have. Things that are already yours. Things that you should walk in and your family should walk in. So that way when things come and they will, and you're squeezed, when you're squeezed, the word of God will come out of you. Know the truth of God's word. Number two, knowing the Holy Spirit is in you. That the greater one lives on the inside of you. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. The greater one lives on the inside of you. Where does fear come from then? Enemy. Then we should resist it. Then it doesn't belong in us. It's not part of our DNA. We resist it. Know the truth of God's word. 
Know that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And number three, we have been given the name of Jesus. Man, he has given us his name, the name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, all fear must bow. All death must bow its knee. Sickness must flee. Lack has to go. Man, that is the most powerful name, all power and all authority. Man, he gave that authority and power to those that are born in his name. That's good news. John 16, says, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace. Peace in me. Here on earth, you're going to have trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. We got to learn to speak. We got to learn to open our mouth. We got to learn to identify things when they come and we got to learn to conquer them god's word has the power to set us free from fear he's faithful let's pray father we just thank you lord we thank you that we have seen the truth lord in your word lord we dug in and we see it holy spirit you're the teacher so we just ask you to brand this this on the inside of us Bring it back to our remembrance. Lord, your word that sets us free. Fear, now we choose to resist you. Right now, fear, I rebuke you. I rebuke you in people's lives. I rebuke you from families. I rebuke you from individuals. In the name of Jesus, fear, I command you to let go, release, and get. Fall dead to the floor, fear. We give you no right, we give you no authority, and we command you to go. Father, we thank you for the freedom that is ours, and that we now walk in. From this day forth, we are free from all fear. We are free from all fear. Thank you, Jesus, for the victory and the freedom that we have through you. I want to give one invitation before we leave. I tell you, it all comes through Jesus. And if you've never received Jesus as your personal, your Lord and your Savior, that's where you, that's where you start. That's where, that's where you have victory through the name of Jesus. And if you've never received him, but you'd like to this morning before we go, I want to lead you in a prayer. We'll all pray it together. It says in Romans 10, 9, and 10, it says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Man, he makes it easy. It's just up to us to declare something and believe something. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. If you've never received Jesus, but you'd like to this morning before we leave out of here today, you're missing something. You're like, man, I, I don't, I'm missing something in my life. Man, fear has plagued my life. I, 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 don't, I, I, don't, I don't see uh, where, where, where victory is even in the glimpse. I, I need Jesus in my life. I need him as my Lord, my Savior. I need him uh, to live big in me. If, you, if you'd like to do that this morning, nobody's looking around, just me. I want to know who I'm praying with. Can you just raise your hand really quick and put it down so I know who I'm praying with this morning? Go ahead. Praise God. Anybody else? I'll give it one more second. Greatest decision. Greatest decision. Greatest decision you'll ever make. It's, a, it's an eternal decision. Heaven is real and hell is real. But I tell you what, there's such peace and joy and strength and courage. Oh, that comes with having Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray this together. Repeat after me. Father God, I'm not perfect. I've messed up in my life. But I thank you for loving me so much that you sent Jesus for me. He died on the cross, but he rose three days later. He lives. And Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior right now this morning. 
live big in my life. Amen. Amen. He's faithful, isn't he? Man, he's good. Amen. Hello, and thank you for joining us this week. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, I'd like you to prayerfully consider partnering with us financially so we can get the Word of God to more and more people. We really do pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if you're in this area, next Sunday at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, come on out and join us. If you're not in the area, then please join us again online next Sunday. Thank you again, and God bless you.